Welcome to the Open Forum. Once again, we have the great privilege of looking together into this precious word, the Bible. My, my, how wonderful that is that we can look into the Bible. Now tonight, before we take our first caller uh, with his question or her question from the Bible, I want to give a brief report of a very, very interesting uh, track trip or where we've, uh, that is now taking place. For about eight or ten years, we have been broadcasting into the country of Turkey. And Turkey is unusually interesting because it is when the first missionary trips began right after uh, the beginning of the church age, uh, it was in the cities that are now called uh, now are in called or found in the land that we call Turkey. Uh, cities like Ephesus and Galatia and and uh, so on and uh, so it, we have great interest in Turkey because that is where the gospel was first brought uh, and we read about that in the book of Acts and and it is also the country incidentally where Mount Ararat exists where upon which the ark of Noah Noah's ark landed after it had been uh, uh, floating for about one year and uh, so it is uh, the land of Turkey is especially interesting now we've been broadcasting there about eight or ten years and it's been an absolute remarkable event that we were able to do that. We made the acquaintance of a, the owner of a radio station, Dr. Mustafa Effi, who was a Christian who had come to know the Lord. And, uh, and uh, we were able to arrange to broadcast into uh, uh, the largest city, Istanbul, which had a has a population of about 20 million people. I understand it is the second largest metropolitan city in Europe, uh, just uh, slightly less than London. And uh, so that's a huge city. In addition, we are broadcasting on individual radio stations in 25 additional small cities that are out uh, that are uh, elsewhere in Turkey. So we reached quite a bit of the 77 million people who reside in Turkey. We have been able to broadcast by God's mercy in the Turkish language, the Arabic, the, uh, where the Turkish language is of course the big language, and in English and Arabic and German and French and, and, uh, I think in one or two others. And so we've had a very, it's a, the, uh, Turkey has a lot of tourists in it. And that's one of the reasons that we're very interested in some of the other languages. But main, the main language is Turkish about, uh, most of the people speak that. Now, Turkish is an especially, uh, interesting uh, country also because it is regarded as a Muslim, as an Islamic nation. Uh, more than, nine, very close to nine, 99% of the population claims to be from that particular faith. And so for Christian broadcasting, such as we offer on Family Radio to come to Turkey, has been a very, very unusual uh, experience and we're so delighted that we've been able to do that and through the help of our friend Mustafa uh, Efni, Efni we've been able to F Epi we have been able to do that and and we've never been stopped from uh, bringing our our uh, radio program there well then we thought about trying to send a truck trip to Istanbul and to some of the other cities. And uh, finally, we, we got a lot of help from Mr. F, Dr. Effie, Effie, and we also uh, uh, have been working very carefully about this. And finally, 
Uh, we uh, f have 10 missionaries there now who have now to date been already passing our tracks for two days. What makes this a very special, especially interesting, is not only that it's almost 100% Muslim, but also the fact that uh, last Sunday, a week ago Sunday, uh, there was a bombing in Istanbul uh, from some direction or another, uh, and 31 individuals were injured. And so that has put the city on a, a fairly tense situation just ahead of our track trip beginning. You, know, you uh, Because, you know, everybody's afraid of terrorists. And, and who are these people who are coming there passing out these tracks? And so the police and everyone else is, is kind of on a high alert right now. Well, but that's the way... God has set it up, and that's the way we're doing it. Now, they, uh, this uh, team of ten people, six, uh, they're all Americans, uh, six uh, men and four women, arrived there in Istanbul last Thursday. And uh, we have reports for the first two days of activity. And uh, it is a, it is a, uh, somewhat different. The, the tracks were all printed locally, and, uh, uh, and they are able to get more if they need need them. Uh, the fact is that they uh, they uh, have, have, have begun. Uh, Friday was a full day of track uh, passing out tracks in Istanbul, and uh, uh, there uh, there was. Uh, uh, let me see. There was a lot of activity in the Taksim area, even despite Sunday's tragedy. And the ambassador placed the tracks and booklets in quite a few hands that the Lord opened up by his mercy. One of these recipients of this gospel of grace was a resident of Oakland, California. How do you like that? who is attending college in Istanbul, and another is a Turkish citizen who is studying at a university in North Carolina and who is in Istanbul on vacation. Uh, the team worked at the university, working at the university, reported that they had a productive day and the fact that there were protest rallies going on at the complex. And there were these protest rallies were not protests against what we were doing, but against some other kind of activity. For our safety, the police advised the team to keep a low profile so that the ambassadors would not come into harm's way. In the afternoon, the team was approached by some plainclothes policemen who informed them that they could not continue the distribution, distribution in the city until we receive the appropriate permission. With the Lord's perfect timing, just when we were having a little difficulty communicating with these officials due to the language barrier, there was a gentleman passing by. And seeing our tea search with the family radio logo, he stopped and interceded for us. It turns out that he is a family radio listener. Thankfully, this interruption came after the team had distributed the majority of its track load for that day. And under God's protection, uh, that uh, there were no riots that were a result of the other political protests that were going on. Another, another team conducted its distribution efforts at the train station. And they, after a few hours, they too were told they could not continue their efforts there, perhaps because they were not too far from one of the largest mosques, uh, Islamic mosques, and a major tourist attraction. But, by God's providence, they had already shared most of their tracks and booklets with the thousands of people they encountered on the, uh, uh, in this location. Then on the next day, which was Saturday, uh, they continued. Uh, 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 it, uh, it's, they write that it seemed no matter where we went, we kept being inter interrupted by the police. 
because the fundamentalist Muslims really did not want us to share this message with the people, even though we did have permission to distribute the materials. And so, yet we did not have the free course to share. And so this, uh, this uh, 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 working in this uh, atmosphere, they did their best in passing out uh, tracks. The team's visits to the police station, where the ambassadors at one time were taken were for interrogation, provided some witnessing opportunities with the officers and their supervisors, a privilege we would not have otherwise enjoyed had we not been taken to the various uh, precinct, uh, precincts. The police chief earmarked certain locations within the city limits that he advised we should not visit so as not to fuel the anger of Muslim clerics and precipitate any unrest. Understandably, the officials are concerned about the protection and safety of the tourist population, tourism being one of Turkey's key industry, industries. Of course, we complied with the directive of the police officers, officials. In that on Sunday, the entire group traveled by ferry across the waterway to the Asian side of Istanbul and visited three cities over there. There were hordes of people in these locations, especially at the ferry pier. And uh, reception was slow in the morning, but picked up favorably as the day pro progressed. But even uh, over in these locations, the, the ambassador still encountered interruptions because the locals complained to the police officials who were duty-bound to investigate even though they recognized that in our distribution, we were not breaking any law. Despite these interruptions, God provided a few meaningful encounters, allowing us to share Bibles. One man was so elated at receiving a Bible that he kissed it and expressed sincere gratitude at receiving the precious Word of God. Well, having these delightful witnessing opportunities indeed give us the impetus to declare this message. And we pray that God's word would prosper in the lives of these dear people as he, is, as allow, uh, as he allows. Though the reception is not as jubilant as we would have become accustomed to on other, as we have become accustomed to on other missions, by God's empowering, we are plodding along as we wait on him for guidance and direction. Well, let's really, really be praying for these, uh, this mission trip because this is a very, very important one. We believe that based on what we know from the Bible that there's a good possibility that many, many people who confess the Islamic faith will end up still try, finally turning to Christ as their Savior, and uh, we're so glad that we've already had two days of this kind of activity there, and let's be praying, oh my, let's be beseeching the Lord that these our ten uh, ambassadors may have, have God's protection, and that they may proceed very faithfully, very diligently, and especially pray for the people of Turkey that there might be many who might turn to him before in the next uh, six and a half months. But uh, that, that's, that's as far as we are going right now. In a few couple more, or two or three more days, we'll bring some more up-to-date reports on how, what is happening there. But now we're going to turn to our first caller on our telephone lines. Welcome to Open Forum. Welcome uh, to Open Forum. Hello? Yes, go ahead with yeah, your call. Have, okay, thanks, Hal. I have a question on uh, John 13, 34. And John 13, verse 34. There we read, A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you that ye also love one another. 
Now, what is your question? And uh, I guess 35 as well, but my question is, um, how do we find this, how do we uh, identify this love in others, and how do we, um, how do we show it to others as well, that, that people may know that we are Christ's disciples? Well, uh, we show this love, first of all, uh, in the same way that we show love for everyone. You know, the Bible says, love our, your enemies. And the Bible says, love your neighbor, and your neighbor is anybody at all who has a need as you love yourself. And, uh, and that is a key uh, that, that helps to explain this verse also. To love oneself, the highest good that we want for me is that I might be a child of God, because, as in my self-love. But now, with that same desire that is that I might truly be a child of God I want the same desire for anybody else that I come in contact with in other words I'd like to see them also become a child of God and that is what helps us to really get a zeal like these people these ambassadors in in uh, 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 Turkey right now and uh, to have a zeal to share this precious gospel with others, that they too might have the highest good in their life. That is the very essence of great love, love for, because as we love one another, we're also showing our love for our Savior. That is, as we love one another with this intense desire to do the will of God, because uh, to uh, the Bible tells us in John 14, if we're going to love God, we will want to keep His commandments. And a very important directive commandment God gives us is that we are saved to share the gospel with others. But thank you for calling and sharing this very interesting verse. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yeah, hi, Brother Campton. How you doing? Very well, thank you. All right. Um, on, on, on the definition of James, in the back of the book of the King James Version, you have James is, is named as several persons in the New Testament, as like the elder and stuff. Uh, on, down further in, in the verse, I have a friend here. They're, they're trying to understand it. Uh, with the tradition of God regards James 3 to be the same person as James 2, what does that mean? I'm sorry, uh, you really have to have the verse, because unless I have the verse in front of me, I can't really, I don't de really dare talk about it. And uh, uh, it's uh, uh, it, it, the James that we have in, uh, in that, written, that God used to give the uh, information to that became the book of James, it would be the brother of the Lord Jesus. That much we do know. But... Uh, 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 I, I'm sorry. You'll have to call back another time when you find your verse. Yes, I got you. I, I figured that would happen that way. All right. I appreciate that, Brother Campton. You have a blessed day. Thank you for calling Thank in. You. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Welcome to Open Forum. The number to call is 1-800-322-5385. 1-800-322-5385. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Brother Camping? Yes. Daniel 12, verse 2, please. Daniel 12... Verse 2. There we read, And many of them shall that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Now, what is your question? My question has to do with the word awake. You have been teaching that the unsaved dead will never come back into conscious existence. Yes. But this verse indicates that both the saved and the unsaved will awake. 
Well, th th that apparently is what it looks like it is teaching. But the uh, problem is that uh, that uh, uh, when we study the rest of the Bible, we find that uh, that uh, that uh, there's no, no verse anywhere in the Bible that once a person dies, unless he is a child of God, that he'll ever have conscious existence again. But there will be a resurrection of that person, but not as a live person. We read in Ezekiel chapter uh, chapter uh, 37, Ezekiel 37. Uh, uh, we read in verse 3 where God is teaching us that that bones can hear the word of God. Now we say, oh, come on, that's crazy. Bones are just dead. There is no life in a bone. Well, isn't there? Well, let's see what's what God says. In verse 37, uh, or in, in Ezekiel 37, verse 3, God tells Ezekiel, Son of man, can these bones live? And, he, and he, he's looking at a field where there are bones that are very dry. In other words, they're as dead as dead can be. Can these bones live? And I answered, O oh Lord Jehovah, thou knowest. Again he said unto me, Prophesy upon these bones, and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of Jehovah. And thus saith the Lord God unto me, these bones, behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and ye shall live. Now, in other words, can bones hear the word of God? We'd say, Oh no, they're dead. They're they're just they're they're dry. Uh, but God is saying here, oh yes, they can hear the word of God. Of course, in this context, it is talking about the true believers that they will be resurrected. They because our bodies are dead. If we die, our bodies, our bones are all completely dead, and we rise to spiritual life. We receive our brand new resurrected souls. But if the bones of uh, God is making a point here that the bones can hear the word of God. And so uh, there is a resurrection of the unsaved as if they were alive uh, because they uh, have to be, they're going to be thrown out uh, of their grave with their corpse or with their bones or their ashes or dust, whatever is left. The Bible has plenty to say about about the fact that they will be thrown out and it will be a final uh, shame in the eyes of God. These people will not have any conscious existence. There's nothing in the Bible that anyone who died as an unsaved person will ever again have conscious existence. That, uh, if, if that was the meaning, there would have to be, we'd have to find other evidences and there is nothing in the Bible like that. And so we know that, yes, there is a resurrection of the believers and the unbelievers, but the unbelievers, it will just be their remains, their body or, 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 the, or their uh, bones or whatever is left of them, whereas, whereas in the case of the true believers, it will be in the, uh, 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 say, live personality because we... Our sins have been paid for by the Lord Jesus, and it's ordained for the true believers that we are going to spend eternity with Christ with a, uh, in a brand new resurrected body as well as in the new soul that we, see, we received at the time we became saved. But Brother Camping, verse 12, 2 in Daniel indicates that there is everlasting contempt. What does that mean, everlasting contempt? Or that these bones, let me see, let me read that again. Daniel 12, Daniel 12 verse 2. Let's look at that again. Daniel 12, verse 2. Uh, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Contempt is another word for shame. And that simply means that never, never again will there 
uh, uh, the, when they are shamed, they are, that's the last of them. There is, uh, uh, they'll never, never uh, recover from that shame. That is, the, uh, they are dead forevermore. And in fact, a few m- months after their, after their bones are thrown out of the tomb, they will be annihilated forevermore. They'll never, never, never have have uh, a relief from the shame that they received because of having uh, sinned, and now God is shaming them in His eyes in this way. But it's just like that word "everlasting." Let's go again to the book of Jude, where God defines that everlasting in uh, in Jude chapter uh, uh, in Jude verse uh, verse uh, 7 God talks about Sodom and Gomorrah as an illustration of judgment and of course these people who are we're talking about who are uh, whose bones are being going to be thrown out they are the ones who are under God's judgment and he says in verse 7 of Jude even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, there it is, an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. In other words, here we see that word everlasting, eternal. Now, the big question is, what is the everlasting? Is it referring to these individuals suffering forevermore or is it saying that the fire is such that these people will be dead forevermore and we all we have to do is look at the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah because that was the example how long did that fire did those fires burn forevermore no no they burned for a, a, a day or two days or three days that we that we can go over there to where they, uh, Sodom and Gomorrah are located. There's no fire burning there. But it meant that the everlasting applied to those who were consumed. They are forever, ever, ever dead. And so, uh, again, these who are, uh, uh, and, and, and that dead is emphasized by annihilation. And so likewise, the shame by annihilation is forever. But thank you. And we're going to have to pause. We're continuing with the Open Forum program, and shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Uh, Good evening, teacher. Revelations, chapter 5, verse 6, please. Revelation, chapter 5, verse 6, chapter 5. Verse 6, there we read, And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. Now the question, what is your question? Okay, the lamb is Jesus, but these uh, seven spirits of God... Is he seven entities? Is that the, when it, the Bible says the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, is is there seven Holy Spirits? What is, what is no, that? no, this is, uh, our God is one, uh, and yet God is very mysterious. God does present him, himself to us as three distinct persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, yet there is one God, and our human minds were not designed to understand that. We just accept it, even though we don't understand it. We know what is, uh, all of that is true. Now, the, the number seven is a number that is spiritually used in the Bible to signify perfection, perfection. And here we see the identity of the Holy Spirit with the Lord Jesus Christ, because the the uh, the four living uh, the uh, the Lamb uh, that has been slain that is a portrait of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the seven spirits are the perfection of the Holy Spirit that identifies with Christ. So we can't take that as a literal. 
number that the guy, that he does have seven. Oh, no, absolutely no? not, not, not. There's no way. Uh, and yeah. God uses the number seven again and again and again right. to signify perfection. Uh, okay, because it also says the seven lamp stands and there's the Spirit of God. And I just, all right, well, thank you for your, uh, your input on that. I appreciate it. I'm, just, I'm still puzzled with it, but thanks for your time. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Brother Camping, how are you? Very well, thank you. Uh, my question is, uh, you know in the Bible it talks about there'll be two in the field, one will be taken, there'll be two at rest, and one will be taken. The question is, uh, when it says about the two sleeping and one will be taken, does that mean sleeping spiritually, like uh, they're in the darkness, but one might be taken? Well, if... Two are sleeping. Uh, ordinarily, a husband and wife are in the same bed. That's not uncommon at all. And it could be that the wife is taken and the husband is left. Or it could be the husband is taken and the wife is left. Just because they're married, it doesn't mean that both are true believers. Only the true believer will be taken. It could be that both of them are true believers and they'll both be taken. But the point that God is making is that we are saved one by one. It's an individual relationship between one individual and God himself. We're not saved as a group. We're not saved as a family. We're not saved as uh, uh, friends. We are saved. Each one is a personally uh, answerable to God. And and uh, no matter how intimate our relationship may have been, as intimate as, you know, uh, to be in the same bed, it's a husband and wife, and the two become one flesh, the Bible says. So that's a very significant statement that, yes, yes, uh, in the marriage relationship, you are very, very, uh, indeed, you are looked upon as one flesh. But when it comes to salvation, each one has to stand individually before God. I see. So there's no undertone of meaning there in the darkness. doesn't mean that people... If there's no undertone there. It means exactly what it says then. No, it simply, it simply uh, says two will be in the same bed. And, of course, in our day, oh, okay. there's so much sin going on. It's fantastic how much sin. And so there might yeah. be two in the same bed that don't belong together. And uh, the likelihood is neither one of them are going to be uh, taken. They're going to be, re re they're both are going to be in trouble. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you, you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, uh, my question is uh, chapter 13 on Mark, chapter 13, verse 32. Mark 13, verse 32. Mark 13, verse 32. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. Now, what is your question? Now, my question is that not even the angels know the day or the hour. No. Why is it that you proclaim the day and the time? Oh, because uh, we, you, you have to remember, we have to read the whole Bible. And uh, uh, during the church age, which continued for a period of 1955 years, uh, when we go through the Bible very carefully and develop the whole God uh, told the, by, the timeline of the, of the gospel. It began in 33 A.D., and at that time, uh, the disciples asked Jesus, can uh, effectively, I'm paraphrasing, but you read about this in Acts 1, effectively they're asking Jesus, uh, when will be the completion of the, the salvation program? And then Christ responded to them in Acts 1, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons. 
Uh, in other words, that's not something that I'm going to reveal throughout the church age. And then he went on to say, you are to be my witnesses in in uh, Jerusalem and uh, the uttermost parts of the world, uh, out into the whole world. Get busy, in other words, and bring the gospel and don't worry about that. So throughout the church age, which ended in 1988, it was impossible for anybody, however thorough a theologian they were, however diligent or however they loved the Lord or whatever, or how bright they may, brilliant they may have been, they could not know the details of Judgment Day. They could not know the time of the end. Uh, uh, that was not going to be given to them. But then as we uh, read the Bible, we find that during the uh, final Great Tribulation, this final 23-year period that ends with Judgment Day, uh, God has arranged it that there's a lot of information that has been written in the Bible already in the book of Daniel, for example, as well as other places, that we would he would open our spirit, the uh, spiritual eyes of the true believers and they would learn a lot more information and amongst other things they were given if they were shown how we can know the time the uh, the de the uh, uh, day uh, when Christ is going to uh, rapture the true believers, catch them up, uh, which will be simultaneously with the beginning of the day of judgment. And that was, we, as we continue to study that question, and God has given us marvelous proofs that we have indeed been able to learn that. He also uh, indicated that this is uh, because uh, yeah, we have to be I able to warn the world that is a mandate yeah, I, God gives, that we have to warn the world of that date, and, and so he gives us that date. Well, do, do you think that the Bible's contradicting itself if it's saying that no man, not even the angels, neither the Son, so are you saying that the Bible says one thing, but it's really saying another? I mean, if someone no, says that's no is yeah. no and yes is yes. It, you have to look at it. First of all, the Son is not Jesus. That's impossible, because Jesus is... Uh, identified completely with the Father. If anybody has seen me, has seen the Father. The Son can either be the, ch the God, in one place God implies that the uh, congregations would be called, could be called the Son, and in another place we find that Satan, who has been very, very important right from the very beginning in God's whole salvation plan, uh, that he doesn't know either. He's called the son of perdition. He is, it's the same language. Uh, the, the translators, you know, they capitalize the word son, and that is not the way it was in the original Greek at all. And that already gives us a false idea of what God is teaching here. But when he's saying the son, it's impossible that it could be the Lord Jesus because the Lord Jesus is eternal God. And uh, but uh, but nevertheless, it and uh, and a fact by using by putting the word the son there, God further complicated the whole matter. God has written the Bible that way. He has not made it easy to understand. But it, under no circumstance is he saying that that would be continuous all the way to the end of time, because there's plenty of other information that shows us that we can know. The, uh, the timing and have to know the timing otherwise we can't obey God's command to warn the, the uh, world uh, that the sword is ready to, to, to come on the world but thank you for calling and sharing and shall we take our next call please welcome to Open Forum yes hi brother Camping yes I'm, uh, I'm calling to find out about the tree of life in the in the on the Old Testament in Genesis. Yeah, well, the tree of life is the is the picture of the Lord Jesus. He is a tree of life, and uh, it was in the Garden of Eden. And uh, remember, uh, the uh, and in that beginning time, the Garden of Eden uh, 
actually the whole world that was created was super beautiful because it was perfect and so why would there be a, a garden of eden well that represented the kingdom of god and our god already was in creation was demonstrating how his salvation plan was going to go that the world would become sinful but in the world there would be the kingdom of god that was typified by the garden of eden and it's in the kingdom of god that we find the author of life the giver of life the lord jesus who is typified by the tree of life and notice that once adam and Eve sinned, they were driven out of the garden, that is, they were no longer identified with the kingdom of God, and they could not get into the garden to Christ, or to the tree of life, unless they went through, remember there were a cherubim with flaming sword keeping the way, and that represented God as the judge, it represented the uh, the uh, sword of the word of God, and uh, and we can't get to Christ except through uh, having have our, had our sins paid for. And that's work, the work that Christ did in order that he might become our Heavenly Father. That he would, uh, he would, uh, we would be his children. I see. Brother Camping, another question. No, excuse uh, me. I, I'm, <laughs> I forgot to uh, emphasize. We like to allow each one just one question. We have so many people trying to call in. Could you hold your other question for 30 days and then try again? Thank you very much. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Uh, Mr. Kampan, uh, uh, yeah. my question is in regards to um, the passage in, in the chapter in John, the Apostle John, uh, in which uh, he talks about Greeks uh, coming to see Jesus. What, what is the reference, John what? In the Gospel of John, uh, almost at the end, uh, he uh, John writes that some Greeks came to see him, uh, to speak with him. And my question is in regards to that. Uh, my question is specifically, why was Jesus troubled? Why, why, why was he worried when these people came to see him? I wish you would find the reference and then call back because I like to answer questions looking at the language of the Bible because every word is very important. And uh, if I give an answer... Uh, normally, I'm, I, I don't trust myself unless I'm really looking at the Bible. But okay. thank, you. Take your time. thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, Mr. Camping. Yes. Um, I actually I have a question about um, what happens to marriages on Judgment Day. My question being... Um, whether or not um, those who are saved experience death, because I know in our vows we um, say until death do us part. So I just was wondering, um, in heaven, like, if the marriage is dissolved, you know, to be with Jesus, or I, I wanted to understand that better. Well, they, 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 you, all we know is what the Bible gives us. There will be two in one bed, That in case that would emphasize two people who are married, and one is taken and the other is left. And the one that is taken is instantly uh, or changed into a glorified spiritual body and is caught up uh, in, uh, into heaven uh, to be with Christ forevermore. The one who is left may have been convinced that he or she too had become saved but now because they're left there she'll he or she will know oh no and it'll be it'll hit that person like a ton of bricks like a a blow a terrible blow that they are left behind and uh, and uh, are are subject to the judgment of god and that's that's as much as we know um, what about, what my question is, um, if, let's say, in the best case scenario, um, both parties in the marriage is, in the marriage is saved, then is that marriage still recognized in heaven, or does that dissolve? Oh, uh, no. 
Yeah, no. The uh, the Bible tells us in Isaiah that uh, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former is not remembered or come into mind. In other words, the whole issue, the whole experience of of earth with uh, existing 13,023 years because that will be the total duration of, of, of uh, our present uh, earth and, and solar system and so on uh, and it's all going to come to an end and it'll be remembered no more it'll be annihilated and so those who do become saved will remember nothing of the past at all. All they know is it's a brand new world, a new heaven and a new earth that they enter into, which is going to be super, super, super wonderful. And they have a whole uh, eternity in front of them as they are reigning with Christ and as they are co-heirs, co-owners with this new heaven and new earth. And we don't know any details about that. God doesn't give us except that it is going to be super wonderful. God talks about the street, streets are paved with pure gold. You know, that's a figure of speech just to show. It's something that's very glorious. And there's no suffering or crying uh, because it's, everything is perfect. Okay, well, thank you so much. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, good evening, Brother Compton. Yes. Yeah, I have a question. Somebody just called about, like, I think the second call. And you said the sun, no man knows the hour, uh, even the sun, the sun refers to Satan. And what about, uh, I'm the, uh, about Christ. He is the, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So does it mean that the sun is also a Satan? Doesn't the sun? Because the, uh, the uh, Jesus Christ, well, the in Lord, that, in, He's the Lord, is the Father uh, and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Now you say that the sun is for uh, like Satan. So does it mean that the sun and the uh, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit, the sun means that is Satan? Well, excuse me, the word, yeah, we're looking at a verse uh, that neither the Son, and take off the capital S out and make it an ordinary S because that was the way it is written in the original Greek. Neither the Son. Now, it is uh, talking about knowing the time of the end, and Christ is eternal God. He and the Father are one. It, it says in that verse that the Father knows. So if the Father knows, the Lord Jesus knows. Uh, because He is eternal God. You cannot separate uh, the Lord Jesus from the Father insofar as knowledge or, any, or anything else. Because if Jesus said, if any man has seen me, he has seen the Father. And so... Then we see that word, phrase, the Son, and we say, well, then who could that be? It can't be God. It cannot be God. So we search the Bible. And as we search the Bible, we find two possibilities, and it could be either one of those two top possibilities that God has in view. Uh, we find in uh, in, uh, in uh, Second Thessalonians 2, where, Christ, where Satan is called the Son of of perdition. Well, okay, that he could be in view because he's been very, very important all the way through. He, he ruled the world, you know, for 11,000 years. But he didn't know anything about the time of the end. That would make a lot of sense. Or I, when uh, Christ was hanging on the cross and he told, uh, told uh, uh, Mary, uh, behold thy son, uh, behold the son, and this, and and uh, cry, and uh, uh, he was t talking about one of the disciples, and and uh, who uh, was also called the son, and uh, and represented the, the congregations, the New Testament church age, and they didn't know either that that fits the context that neither the son. 
So you can take your pick. You can. It could be Satan, or it could be the congregations. Neither one had any knowledge of the timing of the end, and that uh, that agrees with everything else the Bible teaches. In fact, it says neither the angels and and Satan is a fallen angel. So. Uh, that fits right into that picture also, possibly. But it is not Christ. That The Son cannot be Christ. That is absolutely impossible. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call? Please welcome to Open Forum. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello? Yes. Let me turn off my radio. Yeah, good. Thank you. I listen to KFRN, and we're having a lot of problems with it. I can't even hear, and uh, it's a lot of interference going on. And I've called uh, the office about three times about it, and nothing's being done. And okay, then yeah, but... um, I also rely on the Internet, and the Internet plays pre-recorded messages every day. And I, I want to know how come I can't get today's message on the Internet, because I can't listen to my radio because of all the interference. I, I, I don't know. I will do this, however. I will check on what's going on at KFRN. That's the best I can do. I don't know anything right offhand, but I will, I will definitely take a, uh, find out about that. Would you check on the internet too, so I can get the messages? If we, and just in case this problem can be solved, that I can listen to it on the internet without the pre-recorded messages, please. Well, that's uh, yeah. The, uh, aren't they on? You can't get it on the internet either. They're pre-recorded messages playing every day, and I can't get today's message on it. Well, I uh, I'll check that also. I'll check that also. And okay, I'd greatly appreciate it because I love listening to your program. I count yeah. on it every day. Thank you for calling and sharing, and I'll try my best to get some information. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, uh, I've been listening for a while uh, to your teaching on this uh, five-month period of death and destruction, if you will, I, I don't really see that anywhere in the Bible. Not only, it, it doesn't make any, I don't see it in Scripture, and I, it just doesn't make any sense. People have, unsafe people have died for thousands of years, and then for the last 153 days of the world, they're going to be kept alive. It, it doesn't make any sense. Well, I'll tell you, if, if we are going to tell God what makes sense, we wouldn't agree with a whole lot of things in the Bible. It doesn't make any sense at all that God would would die in order that I might become saved. That doesn't make any sense at all. But he did. He did. Uh, and uh, we don't go to the Bible because it makes sense to our minds. We go to the Bible to learn what God has to tell us. And, uh, and uh, we are again and again have to say, just stand back and wonder, ah, how is that possible that God would do this or do that? And so please don't ever go to the Bible with the attitude, well, it, it has to be, make sense to me because the, the Bible doesn't make any sense. It is, it is uh, something that is just extraordinary from every vantage point if we look at it very honestly. Um. I'm sorry. Uh, what I meant to say was there, there's no scripture that supports that teaching. There, there's no scripture that supports five months well, of, uh, you know, of a rapture and then five months. It just it doesn't exist. That five months in Revelation 9:5 it speaks of torment. It has absolutely nothing to do with um, death and destruction as you're making it out to be. Well, that may not make any sense as we just I'm look at it, it, but when we work through it very carefully it fits perfectly and it, please get a copy of we're almost there have you read that yeah uh, that, i actually have that uh have you really read it very I, carefully i really i really have and i i can't find like the your reasoning in the verses that are being used 
um, uh, to, uh, to I'm support sorry. that I, five months. Uh, we have tried our best to be faithful to the Word of God and laid it all out. And I'm sorry. I, I, uh, the Lord has to open your spiritual eyes. I, I can't. I, I, I can only tell you that we find that it fits perfectly and there's uh, the uh, there, there's no question at all that that uh, uh, there there will be a five months uh, day of uh, day of judgment even though we can't understand why it has to be five months but it is but thank how do you, you get for how do you get five in. months of uh, death and destruction from torment well, you, you, the five months come right from the Bible. It, it is, the, the, we, we, when we go through Revelation 9 very carefully, we find that it does talk about the day of judgment. And there it emphasizes five months. We have to pause. We're continuing with the open forum, and shall we take our next call? Please welcome to open forum. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, hello, Mr. Camping. Um, concerning the story in chapter 19 of Genesis, where Lot keeps the angry townsfolk people out, I've pondered on this for 30 to 40 years. The story in Joshua chapter 19, same chapter, but in Joshua, um, are you familiar with that, Excuse with the me. keeping looking... of the men from raiding the house also? And what does that have to do with each other? Joshua 19. Joshua. It's a long, it's a long chapter, but halfway through, it all has to do with each other. Well, what I, I'm I, I'm sorry. In uh, in uh, Genesis 19, it is talking about the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, and in uh, Joshua 19, that, that's in Genesis 19, and in Joshua 19, uh, yeah, I don't read any uh, uh, any. Uh, destruction there it's talking about the the division of the of the land of Canaan uh, as they are casting lots and this part this part was given to uh, one tribe and that part portion was given to another tribe and so on and so what is your what is your question really it it, it is the same story I'm gonna I've got the verse right here for you um Which verse is it? Oh my, we must have lost oh, you. No, no, I have you right here. Um, the, the Genesis 19 story with Lot, with Abraham. Yeah. Oh, you mean about the division of the land? No, about Lot keeping them out of the house. About Lot keeping them, uh, uh, yes. Yes, has the deal of Judges 19. I'm sorry, Judges 19. Oh, this, well. The, yeah, uh, I'm sorry okay. about that. Uh, and Judges 19 is a very, a very difficult chapter. It's a, yeah. It's a, it's it's a very same. difficult uh, chapter. And uh, I'm not sure, I'm not sure that I can help you with this. Uh, 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 it is. Uh, uh, the, the, there's a couple of chapters here that are uh, that I, I've really never had an opportunity to work very carefully, although I've looked at them very seriously and to make sure that uh, they're not talking about something that might have to do with God's timeline, and they don't. And but uh, I I I don't feel qualified to really get into detail on Judges 19. Okay, you answer a lot of questions for a lot of people. Could you go to um, John chapter? What What is your question, please? Eddie. Well, my question was, what do they're they're practically the same story in in 
Judges 19 and Genesis well, they, 19 they, they, as far they, as keeping the men of the town out of their, keeping the men safe who they brought into their house. Yeah. And the men, and them throwing the daughters and the concubine out. It's the same story as Genesis. Yeah, but it's altogether a, a different story, and it's very, and on this program I would not have, and I haven't looked at it recently, and I, I, I'm i aware that the concubine was ravished and so on and so on, and, uh, and all that followed after that, the okay. death of the Benjamites, Benjaminites and so on, but I, I'm, I really I, I'm not able to make, get into a, a, an intelligent discussion on this on this program. Yes, I understood when you told me, and I asked, then could you just answer another question of mine, a simple one, in John 12? What, John 12? Yes. Yeah, what, what, what verse? 20. Verse 20? 23. 20, and there were 20. certain Greeks among them that came up to worship, and the same came therefore to Philip, and desired him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. And Philip cometh and telleth Andrew, and again Andrew and Philip told, tell Jesus. And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour is come, when the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it shall itch. Abide it alone, but if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. Now, what is your question? My question is, I've also pondered about that for many decades, that he says many times, six to be exact, Jesus our Lord does, that my hour is not come, starting right off with his mother in the beginning. At the, at the wedding feast. But all of a sudden, as soon as the Greeks ask, he, Jesus states, mine hours come. Yeah, no, is that so your is question? Is there any no. translation there? Yeah, well, what the, the reason is, uh, is there's a, I can see, it, and there may be other reasons, but one big reason is that, uh, that, up until that time, the main focus of the gospel has been on the nation of Israel. Greek, uh, the Greece, uh, Greece was a, a uh, representation of the whole world. That was the language of, that uh, even though it was ruled over by Rome, the world, the known world was ruled over by Rome. Nevertheless, the uh, impact of of uh, the uh, reign of Alexander the Great that started 300 years earlier was still all over. And the Greek, in fact, the, the New Testament was written in the original language, uh, the Greek language. So the Greek, uh, the Greeks represented, in effect, uh, the fact that the gospel was going to go to the whole world. And so and when the, he said, the hour has come, me, these are that the, the three son of man, excuse written. me, excuse me, when he said that the hour has come, that the Son of Man should be glorified, well, that's the way, that's the glory of God, that salvation, or it's one aspect of the glory of God, that the salvation would go to the whole world, typified are, by the grace. There, there are three languages written above. Yeah, but the, the fact is that uh, that Greek, yeah, the Bible itself, where the New Testament is written in the Greek language. It, it, the Greeks made an in powerful impact on the world of that day. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Harold. Yes. Um, I want to read Proverbs 11, verse 27. He who diligently seeks good seeks favor, but evil comes to him who searches for it. Now, I just want to call and say that I want to approach the world with a broken and contrite heart. Thanks for being on the radio, guys. Well, thank, thank you, you very for much. calling Bye. and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Welcome to Open Forum. 
Uh, shall we take our next call? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Mr. Camping. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Go ahead. Okay. Your call. Um, I I have a sister that um, I guess she's heard it recently from a pastor, or maybe she's heard it over the years growing up from churches that we've been to, and maybe she's read about it. Maybe she's heard it from friends and all that kind of stuff. She she believes and insists that somebody has to invite Jesus into their hearts and then accept him. And then when that happens, God then will look upon that person and save them automatically right on the spot. Could you please tell us from the Bible that that's not taught anywhere, that well, that is not what gets us saved, well, you, is because we accept Christ? You see, that is a... Uh, a teaching that is very, very common in in many, many, many evangelical churches. Uh, she has been carefully schooled and trained in that, and she has become convinced that this comes right from the Bible. Because these same churches, if you ask them, uh, what do you teach? Where does that come from? Oh, from the Bible. And the Bible is infallible. We believe it is absolutely infallible. It's inerrant. And so you get a lot of assurance that the, that church is being absolutely faithful to the Bible. But they, what she doesn't recognize, what, the, what that church doesn't recognize, those theologians don't recognize, is that our work cannot make any contribution to our salvation of any kind because all the work was done by the Lord Jesus. And the moment that we invite Jesus, that's a work that we're doing. We're putting our trust in the fact, I did something. Therefore, that that helps me to become saved. And uh, we read in Galatians 2.16, this is one of the easiest verses to to show, but you got to make sure you're reading the right Bible because some of the Bibles have maligned or have have changed this verse because they don't like it. They want to make it conform to what your uh, what uh, the churches teach. But in, in the, it sh it should be translated this way in Galatians two verse sixteen. Galatians two verse sixteen, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law. And in other words, any work that we do, or any time we try to keep the law of God, like in, like uh, uh, accepting the Lord, or or uh, getting baptized in water, or making profession of faith, anything like that, we're trying to be obedient to what God commands us to do, or to believe on Him. Uh, we we're trying to be obedient, and that's a work of the law. And the Bible says that uh, no, that a man is not justified. Justified means become saved by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Faith is work, and Christ has done all the work. By the faith, by the work that Christ did, that makes us saved. He did all the work. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. And if, if, you, if you want to know that faith is a work, all we have to do is go to 1 Thessalonians First Thessalonians uh, chapter 1 and there we read in verse First Thessalonians chapter 1 in verse 3 remembering without ceasing remember these words came from the mouth of God they're not written here by a theologian they're written because God has uttered them they came from God the, remembering without ceasing your work of faith work of faith and uh, labor of love and so love and faith are both works that we do and therefore any uh, any faith that we show
can never, never make a contribution to our salvation because we are, uh, uh, we are not justified by any work of the law. As Christ has done all the work. She also believes that you teach something called Calvinism, and I know what that is. And uh, she, she, she just, I, you know, I'm trying to beg, I, I, just, I'm dropping to my knees practically, and I'm trying to, you know, yeah. tell her to please open up her heart to the Bible, open up your heart to the Lord. It's right here. It's so plain. It's as plain as the nose on your face. Yeah. Well, and the fact teach... is, I don't even teach Calvinism at oh, all yeah, because Calvin had a wrong understanding of yeah. salvation. Yeah. He, he had a wrong understanding of salvation, and I don't teach Calvinism at all. I just teach mm-hmm. what the Bible says. Yeah, that's what I tried to explain to her, but no, nope, no, she thinks you're just one of the falsest prophets she's ever heard of. I'll keep praying for her, and I'll try to keep talking to her every now and then, yeah. here and there. You're okay, right. Thank you. Thank you. God, God has to open her spiritual eyes, yes. and so you pray for her. Right. And thank you, and thank shall you. we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. You could look at Luke twenty thirty four through thirty six. Luke twenty. Luke twenty, verse thirty four to thirty six. There we read. Luke twenty, verse thirty four. And Jesus answering said unto them, The children of this world marry and are given in marriage, but they which shall be accounted worthy to obtain that world and the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage. Of course, and what is your question about this? Um, on, on verse 36. Uh, and verse... Thir- uh, ne- ne- uh, neither can they die anymore for they are equal unto the angels and are children of God, being the children of the resurrection. Uh, it's not. It's not the same that only believers will be resurrected. Only believers. Mm-hmm. Well, yes, there. Uh, of course, only. Yeah, that. That's certainly. Are taught here is taught all through the Bible that the believers are the ones who, uh, because they have been, they have received life through the Lord Jesus Christ. But uh, uh, yeah, those who want to believe that the unsaved are going to be resurrected, uh, they uh, they uh, 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 don't understand all these verses. They 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 put their own understanding of it on them. But I totally agree. Thank you for calling and sharing. And welcome, shall we welcome. take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Brother Campin, how you doing? Very well, thank you. Yeah, I got, I got an interesting question to ask you. I mean, if you're really 100% sure that, the, that you're saved and that the rapture will happen and that, that you'll get raptured, how can I have the same assurance that you have that I'll be saved and that I'll be caught up in the rapture on May 21, 2011? Well, you cried to God. I can't give you assurance. I can't give anybody assurance. Only God can give that. And you cry out to God for his mercy and keep crying and begging him for his mercy and keep reading the Bible. And, and uh, you know, the evidence of salvation is we have an intense love for the word of God intense love for God and an intense desire to be obedient into everything that the Bible teaches and and I can't give that to you at all only God can give that to you so you just cry out at, to God for mercy it all everything comes from God and thank you for calling and sharing and shall we take our next call please welcome to open forum Hello, Brother Cafe. Yeah. Uh, I'm only 13 years old, but I have a question about when the world's going to end. Um, what time is it going to end exactly? What time will it end? It will end on 
the uh, the uh, salvation program will end on May 21. The time of the day, I'm not very uh, you know, interested in that. Although, if anybody wants to pick a number, a good number to pick is that when it's noon in Jerusalem. But I I find that when it talks about the hour, uh, and uh, uh, that also is a symbol or a word that is. Are, uh, are simply translated time, and uh, it, uh, uh, it I, I I I haven't been able to uh, understand from the Bible that the the very hour is important. Uh, uh, for example, Noah was not given an hour when the the uh, flood would occur. He was given the time. He was given the exact day when uh, God was going to destroy. Uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. There was, uh, it, it doesn't give us the exact hour when this, for, when they were, when it, those six cities were destroyed, or although they are a picture of the judgment of the end. When God was going to destroy the Ninevites, He didn't give them an exact time either. And so, and the word hour is, can be, uh, and the word day, they, uh, they can have uh, other the word day can be referring to the day of judgment or in other words judgment and the word hour can refer to time and God does tell us we will know time and judgment uh, and uh, so we know the day and the hour in that sense but uh, I I have a hard time looking at uh, uh, day and hour as if that is it's meaningful that it's exactly at a certain time of the day but thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello? Yes, welcome to Open Forum. From Genesis 7, verse 24. Genesis, Genesis 7, verse 24. Let's look at that. Genesis 7, verse 24. And the waters prevailed upon the earth a hundred and fifty days. Now, what is your question? Um, can I take that verse, and does it parallel with Revelation 9 for the five months of torment? Because there was a call before. He didn't quite understand. It, it's the Bible's teaching. It's not your teachings, Harold. And um, I understand the five months of, of torment. Can Genesis 7, verse 24... Um, kind of parallel and um, equal Revelations 9? No. I appreciate your question, but it cannot. It's a different number. This is 150 days, and in Revelation 9, it has to be 153 days because completely independent of anything else we working through the Bible, we know that Judgment Day begins on May 21, and we also know the last day of judgment has to be identified with the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles, which that year falls on October 21, which turns out to be exactly five months, uh, uh, a total of 153 days. So there's no possibility that it identifies with this 150 days. Okay, I'm sorry. I thought it would be a parallel to it. I'm sorry. My my mistake. Not at all. Not at all. It's a good question, but it. But I think uh, uh, there is no relationship. But shall we take okay, our thank next? You. Shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Oh, Mr. Camping, how are you? Very well, thank you. Uh, pretty good. I have, um, I've been handing out tracts in Ohio and Indiana, and I'm having a hard time with a, a group from the God's, I think it's called God's Kingdom's Ministries. They have really been giving me a hard time. They won't leave me alone, and, uh, I, I just wish they would just accept the track or something, but they keep following me around, and, uh, it, it's hard to deal with it, and I'm having a hard time passing them out. Uh, do you have any suggestions? Uh, well, first of all, remember that if we're a child of God, we can expect to be reviled, we can expect to be troubled by those who do not agree with us, 
or just listen to the open forum for a while and you'll see uh, how you can be reviled if you hold the truth of the Bible uh, and uh, and uh, you can just be thankful they're not trying to kill you and it's, it just happens to be it's not that fashionable today uh, to uh, uh, to martyr true believers uh, but in many uh, years in the past if you were a true believer and you were trying faithfully to share the gospel you might end up dead and at least you're not ending up there so uh, you just smile uh, and you're, when you're when they revile you and give make trouble you say I, 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 I'm sorry you don't agree I'll keep praying for you and uh, and put your you just cry out to God in your heart, O oh Lord, strengthen me, O oh Lord, have mercy, that I will that I will remain faithful. And then could it be that these dear people that are harassing me, that some of them might come to truth before it's too late? That's a really good idea. I'm going to try to do that. Uh, and uh, I really want to thank you for ministry. It's uh, really helping me a lot. And uh, I'll continue well, with my mission. Thank, thank you for calling. And you know, I, if we're a true believer, we have to remember that the world is not interested in the truth. We are an alien population. We are coming with something the world does not want to hear. And uh, so we can expect some of this in our lives, but we have to remember that Christ knows all about it, and He is the one we're serving, and and uh, uh, we can. Uh, and the Bible clearly indicates that as we are s ser s sending the gospel into the world, we're going to suffer, and it's a it's part of the glory of God that we suffer for Him as we do bring the gospel. But shall we take our next call, please? Welcome. I think it'll be our last call. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, hello, Brother Camping. How are you? Very well, thank you. Um, Psalm 46, verse 10. Psalm 36, 10? No, 46. Psalm 46, 10. 46, 10. We read... Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. Now, what is your question? What does that mean? It means that God will have those who are going to uh, become true believers and rejoice in Christ and exalt his name and give him all the glory. God has his people in every nation, uh, maybe just a small number in some places, but he will be exalted in all the earth. And it also means that when it comes to the end and judgment day, then everybody will have to acknowledge, after all, God is God. But now I have to say, good night.